Okay. Let's go. You ready? Okay, we're going to move along in this teaching series. We're calling it DNA. We're taking a look at uh, Parkwood's DNA. Uh, not any one individual, but we as a church. It's the, it, we said it's the building blocks of who we are. It's the values that God birthed in us long ago, uh, that 100 years ago when we started, but also just that are carrying us along today. So in week one, we talked about how Jesus is our hope. Week two, how the church is our home. Week three, faith is our lifestyle. Week four, generosity is our joy. And this is week five out of six. And uh, we're going to be talking about how integrity is our calling. You're taking notes. Write that down. Integrity is our calling. Uh, This morning, what I want to do is I want to talk to us about being people of integrity. Now, that, that word integrity, it's an interesting word, right? The, the, the root word of integrity is uh, integer. It's that mathematical word, right? It's a whole number. It's a, it's a thing complete in itself. It literally, it, uh, it means that it's a unit of one. So I want you to see the picture here, that living a life of integrity is to live one life all the time. Let me hear you say one. One, one life all the time. But If we can just be honest, sometimes that isn't the case. Sometimes, as human beings, we have a tendency to compartmentalize our lives where we become different things to different people in different situations. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, So you you think about your life like a pie. Let let me help you with this. I love pie. Okay? So I'm going to use a pie illustration today. Uh, this compartmentalizing thing, right? Like for some of us, we have like kind of the, the slice of our life that we're all in right now. We'll, we'll call this slice our church life, okay? And we know how to talk and operate in our church life slice. So somebody asks us, how are you doing? And we respond, oh, I'm blessed, brother. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. With vibrato in our voice, we say it, right? Because... Because we've learned how to talk in our church life. We've learned how to act in our church life. And that's, that's one slice of our life. But then there's another slice of our life, which is not our church life. We'll call this our driving life. I don't even need to preach this point. The Holy Spirit is moving in the house. Some of y'all just got really convicted. It's amazing, right, how how fast we can go from waving holy hands in worship to waving something else, isn't it? (laughs) And we got another slice. We'll call it our golf life or our shopping life or our work life. And that's a completely different us altogether, right? But this is the pie of your life. Now, as somebody who loves pie, let me educate you this morning, okay? A good pie shouldn't taste different in one part of it than it does in another. If it does, your pie's gone bad, okay? A good pie should taste the same no matter where you bite in. All right, so I want you to see the picture now. A person of integrity is the same all the way through. That means that if you catch me at Walmart, I'm Danny. If you catch me at the church, I'm Danny. If you catch me at the gym the one time a year that I go, I'm Danny. I'm looking at you, Brady. He goes every day. I don't know why I'm looking at him. Like, listen, one life all the time, one person through and through. This is what it means to live a life of integrity. And as Christians, that one life that we're called to live is one modeled after Jesus himself. Uh, Listen to this, Ephesians 5, verse 1. This is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. He says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Parker, you need to see this. The calling of God on our lives is is to imitate Jesus and to follow Jesus, not just in one slice, but in all the slices. Not just in one area, but in every area of our life. This is what we call Christian integrity. 
And this is what we're called to. Now, so now that we've kind of defined what it is, what I want to do for, for the rest of my message is I want to try to answer the question, how? Like, like, what does it actually look like for us to live this out? What, what, what does it look like? How, how do we become men and women of Christian integrity? Well, this morning I have two points. That's it. Two points, and then we're going to run to the cross, because by the time I'm done my two points, we're all going to need it. All right? Um, you ready to go? Okay. How do we live out a life of Christian integrity? Here's, here's my first thought for us is this, that we need to be intentional. Be intentional. Like, here's what I know. Nobody is just going to wake up tomorrow morning and accidentally slip into integrity. Like, like no one's just going to wake up and just all of a sudden you're just going to stumble into this. Like, you're just going to be generous with your finances and uh, respectable and loving in all your relationships, and you're going to refuse to uh, engage inappropriately online. Like, it just doesn't work that way. You don't, you don't stumble into living a life of Christian integrity. It's something that we must choose. In fact, it's something that we must be intentional about. I want to show you this. There's several scriptures that I can pick, but this one I believe God laid on my heart. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The author of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, see the intentionality, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And you see the picture, okay? The author of Hebrews is saying that living a life of Christian integrity is kind of like running a race. So, so how do we run the race? Well, by number one, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Yes, absolutely, but not just that. It, it doesn't just say that. It actually says here that we need to be intentional, not just in where we're looking, but we also need to be intentional in what we're discarding. It says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, historically, I think the church has come to this text, and it's a great text, but I, I think we look at it and we see one part. We say, all right, pastor, I got it. I need to stop sinning. It's like, okay, as your pastor, let me just answer. Yes, you do, okay? And so do I. Like, yes, but, but that's not exactly what this passage said. It says, yes, stop sinning. But that, that, that's not it. It says we need to throw off the sins, and then it says, and everything else that hinders us. I want you to listen to me for a moment. We all have things, I'm going to say probably, probably, we all have things in our lives that aren't sin, and Jesus is still asking us to get rid of. Why? Why? Because it doesn't help you run. The, the, the point, Christian integrity here in this image is seen as a race. And there are just some things in our lives. No, I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about sin right now. Yes, sin. But the author of Hebrews puts it into two different categories. Throw off sin for sure. And then we got a whole bunch of other stuff that are like weights in a race. So when I was young, uh, grade school and high school, I was pretty big into track and field. Um, I was a sprinter. So I ran the 100 meter, the 200 meter, and the four by 100 meter relay. Like that was, that was my jam. That, that was, like I, I loved it. That's what I did. And let me, just, let me just tell you, if you're racing competitively, one of the things that you work very hard at doing when it comes to your clothing and your attire, your shoes, your shirts, your shorts, you, you are specifically purchasing stuff and wearing stuff that is ultra lightweight. All right, because the idea is that you don't want to throw on all this heavy stuff that's going to slow you down. So question, Parkwood, question. Is it against the rules to show up to run the 100 meter dash dress for winter? You got boots on, snow pants, jacket. Like, like, is it against the rules? No. Is it dumb? Yes. <laughs> Question. 
Is it a sin to spend a lot of your time uh, binging Netflix or, uh, I don't know, scrolling your social, uh, Instagram, Facebook, wh whatever, like, like uh, gaming all the time? Like, is it a sin? Well, depending on what you're doing, maybe not. But my question is, does it help you run towards Jesus? Probably not, if we're honest. So the author of Hebrews says, yeah, living a life of integrity is not just keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, not just where we look, but it's what we actually throw off in our lives. So it says, throw off sin. Throw off sin. And every other thing that weighs you down. This is the Christian life. This is Christian integrity. Now, let me tell you why this is complicated, okay? The Bible also says that our heart is wickedly deceitful and no one can trust it. <laughs> Let me say this another way. Your heart lies to you all the time. All the time. So this is what's hard when we come to a conversation of like Christian integrity. We don't even know what we need to throw off. We don't. We, 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 we think we know. We might see certain things, but, but the reality is, and, and, and honestly, probably for most of us, there are areas of our life, whether it's sin or it's a hindrance to us, there are probably areas in our lives that in this moment right now, you're not even aware of. But it's that Jesus is calling you to discard, to throw off. In fact, I, I love, so, so what we need to do in this process of being intentional is we need to learn to invite God into the process. I, I love Psalm 139. Just listen to these words, verse 23 and 24. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we can't see ourselves right, we bring God in and we say, God, search me. Is there, is there any part of my life that is compartmentalized? Search my heart. Lord, are, are, are there sins that I'm holding on to that I refuse to let go of? Search my heart. God, is there weights? Is there just stuff in my life that's just slowing me down in the race towards you? Search my heart and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, it's intentional. Come on, just say that loud. Say, be intentional. Be intentional. Oh, one more time. Say, be intentional. be intentional. This is the first way that we walk in uh, Christian integrity. It takes intentionality. Absolutely. But it's not the only way. Here's my second point, is this. Not just be intentional, is that we need to be real. Hmm. Let's talk. Living a life of integrity. Following Jesus properly. Okay, I just want you to understand that it doesn't mean that you're not going to have seasons of doubt or fear or stress, pain. Not at all. Like, I want you to see this. Living a life of Christian integrity doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes from time to time. What it means is that you're not going to fake it when you do. Like, honestly, I don't know where it came from, but one of the things that we seem to struggle the most with in, in the church is pretending like we're okay when we're not. And like, I get it. This isn't just a church problem. It's a humanity issue. Everybody's faking it. But what's, what's difficult is that in the church is that we've, we've got a lot of scriptures that call us to live different from the rest of the world. And yet one of the things that we struggle with often is just pretending like everything's okay when, when clearly it's not. So when I was, I was just talking to my mom right before the service I think I was eight years old when this happened. She thinks I was six. The point is, I was young, okay? Uh, you guys remember Becker's? Yeah, let's hear it for Becker's. Woohoo! <laughs> what a weird thing to cheer for. Uh, when I was, uh, I say eight, my mom says six. Let's split the difference. When I was seven years old, 
I was in a Becker's, and I, the way that I remember it, there was this big wall of candy, and uh, nobody was around. And uh, I had this moment where I, I looked to my left and my right, and no one was there. And when no one was looking, I just took like a handful of candy, shoved it in my pocket, and ran out the door. <laughs> Went home, right up to my room, shut the door, and just pounded back that candy. <laughs> Now, in that moment, to be honest, in that moment, um, I, I'm not kidding. Like, it was, it was like guilt, shame, like all the feelings hit me at once. It was a lot to process, and, um, and it clearly was affecting me. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to go on pretending like nothing was wrong. So I go downstairs, and, and to be honest, in that moment, I, I was just kind of like not myself. So my mom, who knows me best, she just, she asked, like, like, Danny, man, what, she didn't call me man, but <laughs> we had a different relationship, my mom and I. <laughs> and she's just like, Danny, like, what's, what's wrong with you? You're not yourself. And it's like, nothing, mom, everything's fine. And <laughs> no, it's not. Like, you're off. I'm like, no. And I go up to my room and because she loved me, she followed me up there <laughs> and you know, just like, seriously, like, what's, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing's wrong. And, you know, like, I, I, was, I was angry. I was frustrated. It was coming out in all these weird uh, emotions. And finally, my mom, like an interrogator, just broke me. And, uh, and, I, and I came clean, and I, and, and, and I told her I, I stole from, from Becker's. Now, what I didn't know at this time was that my mom knew the owner of the Becker's. So my mom, now, granted, as a good mother, wants me to learn my lesson. So she tells me, listen, tomorrow, Danny, we're going to go back to the Beckers, and I want you to tell uh, the owner, this lady, what you did. So uh, the next day, we go in. My mom's behind me. This lady's standing in front of me. I'm in the middle. And um, meanwhile, she called her ahead of time and told her that Danny's going to come in tomorrow. He stole from you. And I just want him to kind of feel it you know, so he doesn't do this again. And so she kind of prepped her. So, so we go into the store and, and I tell her, I say, listen, I, I, I stole from you. And she said, huh. She said, you have money to pay me back? I said, no, no, but my mom does. She says, she, <laughs> so she tells me, she says, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, you, she didn't steal from me. You did. You need to pay me back. And I said, well, I don't have money to pay you back. So she says, well, you know what happens then? You go to jail. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. <laughs> so at seven years old, I knew enough. I'm too young to go to jail. So I tell her, I'm too young to go to jail. <laughs> to which she responds back. And she says, you're right, you are. What they're going to do is they're going to put you in a foster home. <laughs> so I'm like, what's a foster home? <laughs> they tell me, and she says, that's when they take you away from your mom and your dad and you go live with strangers. I've never stolen again in my life. <laughs> that woman put the fear of God in me <laughs> that day. Like, it's a true story. And eventually I had to go throw out some garbage and that's how I paid off the candy. But, but Actually, the, the point of the story that I want you to see was not this woman. And meanwhile, my mom, first of all, in that whole story, she's just behind me. Or like, stop talking, lady. Like, it was, it was intense. But, but, but what, was, what was interesting was not the day in Becker's. What was interesting was the night before. That moment that I knew that I did something wrong. I knew it. I felt it. And my knee-jerk reaction was, I need to hide this. Like, that was my immediate thought process. I stole. Somebody's going to be angry. I need to hide. And so what I did is I went on pretending like everything was okay, when clearly it wasn't. You know what's interesting? In the Bible, they actually have a word for this. The word, and none of us like it, but it's the word hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy, it was fascinating actually with Jesus is that he was significantly harder on the hypocrites than he was the adulterers or the murderers or the tax collectors. Like there was something in this, faking it, 
pretending like you're something else when you're not, that Jesus takes very seriously. Listen to Matthew 23, uh, verse 1 to 3. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything that they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Jesus says, listen to what they say because they're teaching you the scriptures and the scriptures are always right, but do not do what they do. Why, Jesus? Because they're not being real. They're not authentic. They're not transparent. They they don't have integrity. And and in fact, he goes on from this moment right here in the following verses, and it's uncomfortable, Matthew 23. He goes on like on a tirade Six different times looking at the Pharisees, calling them hypocrites. The word, Pastor Gary, if you could just bring that to me. The word hypocrite uh, is a Greek word, hypocrates, and it comes from an actor in a play. Interesting little historical piece, theater and the arts, like that part of acting, it actually comes from ancient Greece. And so as it started, they would get these masks, right? And they were on little sticks and and they'd get up on a stage and they'd put the mask in front of their head and they'd act out, and some of you are all gonna have nightmares, so I'm not gonna gonna leave that up there for too long. But but, but, but But you throw the mask up and the idea was that the person behind the mask was different than the character they were acting out. It's, it, this is called acting, if, you, if, if you're not aware. And what Jesus does is he gives this, this very important truth that we need to see. And it's simply this, that not everybody who appears to have it all together does. Not, not everybody is being real. Not everybody has integrity. Some people, some people have just gotten really good at wearing a mask. Some people are just good actors. Some people have just, like, like they, they, they're just really good at playing the game or, or pretending. And listen, I, I honestly don't know who I'm talking to this morning but if this is you, I, I just want to ask the question this morning, aren't you exhausted? Like, isn't it exhausting throwing up the mask in different social settings? It, it, like, aren't you tired of just playing the game, keeping up the charade, the facade? Like, honestly, it just must be Exhausting. Listen to Proverbs 28, verse 1. It says this, The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. Oh, I love that. The wicked run away when no one's chasing them. Uh, Sometimes people ask me, Danny, why don't you uh, go jogging to stay fit? And I tell them it's biblical. (laughs) Right here. (laughs) The wicked run when no one's chasing them. Some of y'all need to get right with the Lord, and I'm just. (laughs) Okay, maybe that's not the primary meaning of this text, but what it does mean is this, that those who wear masks, the hypocrites, the actors, it says this, that they're running when no one's chasing them. Like they're just constantly in cover-up mode. It's called a guilty conscience, and this type of leading leads to stress and sleepless nights and security, anxiety, and that's why I asked the question, if this is you, like, honestly, aren't you just tired of playing the game? Listen, the Bible says a few different things, and I just want you to hear these words. It says this, that God loves a broken and a contrite heart. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy apart from me. Love it. The Bible also is like, confess your sins one to another. I've said it, I'll say it again. Like living a life of Christian integrity does not mean that you're not going to make mistakes. It's in this pursuit of Jesus when we do falter, when we do fall, that we're not faking it. That we're not throwing up the mask, right? Jesus is calling us to be 
real. God loves a broken and a contrite heart because in that space, the church can be the church and God can be God. In that space, when we actually come and we, and we confess and we say, man, like it hurts, I'm broken, like it's, it's there that, that really the church can be the church. We can come around each other and strengthen one another and God can be God. We're, we're, we're allowing him room to actually come in because it's in that space that he does some of his best work. We, we need to be honest, Parkwood. We need to be honest, even if, even if that means that that sounds a lot like you just saying out loud, I'm in trouble. Like right now, my, I'm in trouble, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm lonely. I've been reading the Bible and it just seems dry in this season, but somewhere along the line, we learn that if we actually say that out loud, it's like, it's like I can't say that because if I did, then people would know. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the point. That's the, really, this is the point. It's in that space. Listen, you're not fooling God. You're not fooling God. He sees what's behind the mask, but it's in that space that we let the church be the church and we let God be God. It's in that space that we can actually walk out Christian integrity. Uh, worship team, come on, come on back. Th this message is so, so, so important for us. I I've said this here before, but I want to lay it before us again, and it's, it's this, that God is more concerned about doing a work in you than through you. And I just, I just want you to think about that for a moment, because we all have this complex that we, or I shouldn't say we all, some of us, we just kind of think that God's calling us to be like spiritual superheroes, right? Like a spiritual Batman or Superman or Wonder Woman, right? Like we want our capes blowing in the wind and we want people to look at us and just like, oh. But can I just tell you, like God is actually more concerned about doing a work in you than he is through you. To God, okay, to, to God, your character matters more than your career. To God, like your character matters more than your charisma. Who you are matters more than what you do. You see, you see this? Like, this is the heart of God. And this is what he's calling us to be. And the longer that we keep putting up the mask and pretending like everything is okay when it's not, we're just making it harder on ourselves. And even though you might be able to fool me, you can't fool God. In what he's asking and what he's calling us to is to live a life of integrity. Being a follower of Jesus, Parkwood, having integrity is all about the intentional pursuit of Jesus in all areas of our life, all the time, and being honest with God and the church when you're not. This is what he's calling us into. So if you're tired of keeping up the game, if you're exhausted of, of throwing up a mask, like the good news this morning is you don't have to. Jesus is calling you to throw it away and come into a place of safety to enter into the life modeled after Jesus alone and walk in integrity. This is the calling on all of our lives.